So George, how did you get interested in agriculture? Well, I really came to appreciate agriculture in sort of a, a backdoor fashion. It was my interest in history mm -hmm. and my understanding of how great civilizations not only were dependent upon agriculture for food, but that culture really starts in gardens. Uh -huh. In all of the great cities and civilizations of the past, I just sort of followed the footnote trail in history. I would look at the history of our nation and its heroes and then discover, you know, Thomas Jefferson's love of agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that caused me to think of first principles and following that further and further back, you start to see all of these connections and it starts to make sense why it is that God puts the beginning of human culture mm -hmm. in a garden. Yeah. And that's where Adam and Eve began their life, really, is after they've been created, they placed in that garden. And it becomes the spawning ground for the richness and diversity of culture itself, of art and music and literature and ideas. I mean, you just look at, say, a magnificent strawberry like this, and immediately you see incredible complexity. It's a beautiful thing. Incredibly well designed for sustainability. You see all of the seeds, the rich, vibrant colors, the oh. magnificent oh. taste, oh. the nutrition. And then you start to consider all of the other things that Adam and Eve would have seen in the garden that would have been bounteous in their diversity you start to see the genesis, literally, of all of human culture. Hmm. That fruitfulness uh, of the creation that God had, had made, not Adam and Eve, but also all of the creation. And that then becomes a model for the fruitfulness of Adam and Eve themselves and their lives mm -hmm. in the years that would come afterwards. So that takes us back to the original garden. How do you see all that? And what are the implications of looking at Genesis from the historical perspective? Well, in the same way that I think we can trace the creation of ziggurats and pyramids to an early time where people were trying to get back uh, to the, the mountain of Eden, because in Ezekiel we're told that Eden was actually on a mountain. Mm. I, I think we can see that the proliferation of gardens in the heart of the life of men as they began to spread out across the earth, the, the one common thing that we see over and over again in every civilization is the desire to have gardens. It points to this sort of linear trajectory from the early chapters of Genesis all the way through mm -hmm. the history of mankind. It's not just an anthropological sort of phenomenon. It's, it's woven into the longings that we have as human beings that we see through, through all civilizations mm -hmm. and all cultures. Mm -hmm. George, we have been examining uh, the implications of the two different paradigms associated with looking at Genesis. From your perspective, uh, what do you see in terms of implications of the, the historical aspect of Genesis versus another paradigm that would, that would move it into some sort of an analogy? One of the things that I think is very evident from the Genesis account is that it was intended to be understood as linear history. In fact, that's one of the things that the Bible introduces to civilizations that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, the Greeks had a cyclical view mm. of history. The Egyptians had a peripatetic view of history. You have uh, the chaos theory of the Babylonians. With the Bible, you, you have this notion that there is providence, a purposeful plan by God himself, that is then worked out across time in a linear, understandable, traceable fashion. That's woven all through the book of Genesis. And as you've seen with the toldos, the structure of the generations, it is intended to be understood as history. Interestingly, it's always been understood as history. Throughout all of the ages, various theological traditions, East and West, 
it's always been understood as an historical account where details are actually marking out specific individuals, accomplishing specific goals, doing specific things in a specific location. And these things can be mapped, they can be understood. The overarching themes of the Bible can be grasped uh, by the reader when you connect all of those dots. Mm -hmm. Strip away all of that. And what you have are fine sounding epigrams, uh, marvelous virtuous notions without any coherent structure. Mm. Well, George, let's, let's go back to the text for a minute and kind of walk me through um, what has happened there and the implications as we, as we look at that historical narrative. One of the things that you see in Genesis chapter 1 is the structure for time. Uh, the universe is created for a 24-hour day. That is clearly portrayed in Genesis chapter 1. And so everything from the way our sleep cycles and the way our work cycles work all come from that that definitive historical account there. When Moses gives the people the Ten Commandments and then all of the case law that follows the Ten Commandments, that, that is based on an assumption of a seven-day mm. week of 24-hour days. All, all of those case laws are really predicated on that as a, an historical understanding. When you get to Genesis chapter two, you start to see the meaning and purpose of man, uh, what man is here for, uh, that the creation was actually ordered in such a way to facilitate man's purpose, man's destiny, man's calling, even man's relationship with the created order mm. itself. Mm -hmm. Of course, in Genesis chapter three, we see the disruption of everything by the fall. And the implications of an historical fall, an actual man and an actual woman who actually yielded to actual sin have then implications all through the rest of the Bible. In fact, uh, one could say that the book of Romans, for instance, which mm. uh, lays out the doctrine of salvation, is, is essentially meaningless if what Paul is referring to is not an actual historical event. Mm -hmm. When we get to Genesis chapter 4, uh, we start to see the implications of chapters 1, 2, and 3 now applied to culture and the spreading of, of men and nations uh, across the face of the earth. That continues all the way to Genesis chapter 11. And between uh, Genesis 3 and Genesis 11, uh, we have the laying out of this understanding of generations, of covenantal succession. In Genesis chapter 6, we have the great flood all the way through Genesis chapter 9. Mm -hmm. If you start to have localized floods, then you actually rip the roots out of our understanding of covenant, out of our understanding of judgment, out of our understanding of promise, uh, the character and nature of, of God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises, you even begin to, to pull at the roots of ideas like grace, the common grace that is extended to all men and the peculiar particular grace that is poured out on those who are redeemed. All of that really is linked inextricably mm -hmm. to the historical account of Genesis 1 through 11. Mm -hmm. And it seems that even Peter is taking that event of the flood, for example, as a historical event and laying it in the context of what he's pointing to, a judgment that will, that will come. So even judgment is a part uh, of understanding that historical record. And if you take away the metaphor that uh, Jesus and Peter both use of the flood as a way to understand the doctrine of salvation, mm -hmm you start to lose a grip on everything that the Bible is intended to show us, to teach us, and to shape in us. So if we take the historical uh, record and turn it into poetry, what you're saying is that we lose a lot, if not almost everything, that Christianity is based upon. 
Yes, although what I would say is that much of the Bible is incredibly poetic. It's beautifully written. Mm. Just because something is beautifully written does not mean that it is not true mm -hmm. history. Uh, you, you can have all of these poetic structures in place, and, and we see it all through the Bible. There are multiple genres uh, that we see evidenced in the Bible. Even when you take the genre of the Psalms, there are multiple genres within the genre. That doesn't negate the truthfulness of it. Mm -hmm. We all know people who can say things incredibly well and beautifully, and we say, oh, I wish I could have said it like that. Th that does not mean that because it's said well, mm -hmm. that it is somehow mythological. Do we have evidence in the rest of the scripture that those writers, we believed inspired by God, uh, were looking at Genesis from a historical perspective? Yes, an emphatic yes. All through the Minor Prophets, there are constant references back to the events of Genesis and Exodus treating those events as historical events. You can't read the Psalms without a constant hmm. reminder of the history of redemption, which is a series of sequenced providential acts by God amongst his people in space, in time, in history. When we come forward all the way to the New Testament, not only are genealogies essential for our understanding the Gospels, both for Matthew and for Luke, uh, but in the Gospel of John and in the Gospel of Mark, there are constant references back to Old Testament events uh, as actual history. The Apostle Paul understood the events of the early chapters of Genesis as formative, not only for our understanding of history, but for relationships between men and women and their children, uh, the character and nature of marriage, uh, rightness and wrongness in moral relations, including sexuality. All of that is assumed from those early chapters of Genesis, oftentimes quoting the passages verbatim. Mm. Uh, sometimes in the apostolic preaching, they would quote from several different translations, the Hebrew or the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, or an Aramaic vernacular mm. translation. Mm. So they're mixing and matching and saying, all of this mm. points to the same reality, this is history. Mm -hmm. This happened. It's been recorded. And we're to understand where we are and where we go yeah. in light yeah. of where we've been. And when Jesus was asked the question about marriage, uh, he pointed them back to that historical record, did he not? He did. And he quoted Moses specifically as an historical figure who actually said something mm -hmm. that was recorded in the historical account. Mm -hmm. I think most Christians, uh, when we talk about, uh, for example, the life of Christ, that uh, he was crucified, that he was buried, that he spent three days, those are understood to be historical accounts. Right. Why is it that when we look at the account in Genesis that we have a tendency not to want to do that? We have a tendency not to do it because we're constantly exhorted to not see it that way. From the culture around us? The culture around us, uh, from theologians, modern theologians who are trying to somehow, in their minds, uh, fit the truths of scripture with uh, the so-called discoveries of mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. uh, when oftentimes they really don't know the science. Uh, they've, they've not sat down and talked to hydrologists or geologists or, or archaeologists. They, they make assumptions usually from pop science and pop culture, uh, even on matters where there is wide disagreement among scientists. They'll pick and choose which science they're going to believe. Mm which if you know anything about the history of science, you know is an incredibly unreliable mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly bombarded with this message that we have to adjust our view. A lot of Christians I know will take the first three chapters of Genesis and create a separate category for them. And then from Genesis chapter four on, they feel like, okay, this now is reliable history. Uh, but if you look at the 
genre of writing, the character mm -hmm. and nature of the vocabulary, the structure of the whole book of Genesis uh, with its uh, regular punctuations of the toldos. There's literally no linguistic or literary reason to do that. So what's the reason? Well, we've baptized a worldview hmm. onto that and, and we accommodate ourselves to it. George, is this a recent phenomenon of looking at Genesis more poetry than historical, or does that extend back farther than the modern era? Well, it's relatively recent. It really starts with the Enlightenment and higher critical theories of the 18th and 19th centuries. But you can actually trace the trajectory back to the chaos of the 14th century. 14th century was the Hundred Years' War, the bubonic plague, uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church, the Avignon papacy. It was just chaos. And so poets and thinkers began to reflect on the dissolution of Christendom and what might replace it. Hmm. Uh, they gathered in places like the city of Rome where they would look around and they would see the ruins of what was once a glorious city. And they would think, we need to recover that. So the Renaissance was actually not the birth of something. It wasn't a renaissance. It was instead a recovery of an old pagan worldview, yeah. deliberately trying to recover the pagan view of aesthetics, the pagan view of architecture, the pagan view of history. You start to see this even in Renaissance paintings where you have the mythology of Greece and Rome woven into actual historical events during the time of the Renaissance. So you're introducing these ideas, these pagan ideas. Well, once you do that, uh, then it becomes a, a critique of Christendom itself, the assumptions about the Bible, about morality, uh, about the nature of the family. And once you do that, then there has to be a way to get at the non-historicity of the Bible and, and the easiest mark are the early chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. That's where the higher critical theories come from. The Enlightenment, which really was a darkening of, of the thinking of man and the narrowing of the thinking of man, mm -hmm. uh, comes directly out of the Renaissance and the recovery of all of those pagan ideas. Suddenly, Aristotle and Plato become much more authoritative than Moses or the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. So Darwin is not a genesis of a new thought. He arises already in a, in a fairly strong stream of thinking. Yeah, Darwin really comes late to the game. As, as he actually mentions in the preface to Origin of Species, he talks about the fact that he felt like he had to rush the publication of the book because all of those ideas were floating around mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. In a sense, the evolutionary ideas of the ancient Greeks, that, that pagan view of cyclical history, of sort of a, an evolution out of chaos, and then a return back to chaos, and then an evolution back out of it, that becomes kind of a reigning assumption for many intellectuals in the West who were trying to throw off the shackles of Christendom. Mm -hmm. So what Darwin did was he went looking for proof of his assumptions. Mm -hmm. he, he's operating from presuppositions and he goes looking for proof. If anyone actually reads Darwin's works, you start to realize there's not a lot of science there. There's just a lot of assumptions and then picking and choosing uh, peculiar examples that might illustrate his presuppositions. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no scientific evidence there, just a lot of observations and suppositions. Mm -hmm. Those observations and suppositions come out of that enlightenment, renaissance, recovery of a pagan worldview. Mm -hmm. It's a step back in time, not yeah. a step forward. Mm -hmm.